Hey there, Sam Visnick here, Release Muscle Therapy. In this video, we're gonna talk about why you can't touch your toes and why you should stop stretching your hamstrings excessively in order to accomplish this goal because that's not really what you need. So stay tuned, we're gonna cover this topic right now. Okay, so welcome back. And in this topic, we're talking about hamstrings and their relevance to movement and pain and so forth. So one of the reasons why people are oftentimes most obsessed with hamstring flexibility is oftentimes because of the, the perceived association with lower back pain. So it is a conversation topic around this area that if you stretch out your hamstrings, it can oftentimes be something that alleviates back pain. Now, there are a lot of things that can alleviate back pain, but the uh, conversation that should be had is that, that is that something we really want to do and what is the effectiveness level of it? If it was that simple, that all you needed to do is just stretch out your hamstrings and then your back pain would go away, obviously we wouldn't have a back pain epidemic. So that is generally not true. And one thing I'll throw out there just as a teaser is I've been doing this for about 20 years. I've really stopped emphasizing telling people to stretch their hamstrings excessively for at least 15 years. So I rarely ever do that. But does that mean that I don't look at the hamstrings? I don't uh, evaluate the hamstrings? Absolutely not. It's just a different lens by which I view them. So the hamstrings, real quick, have two primary functions here. What their job is to do is they can help with hip extension. They're buddies with the glutes, but they also flex the knee so they can curl that leg up just like this. It has a dual function. Not a lot of uh, muscles in the body have those kinds of dual functions acting on two joints. It is an important muscle group, especially on the backside. It does attach to the bone that we sit on, so that sit bone, so it has influence on that. In the standing position, and those of you who've been out looking at this information for a while on structure and movement mechanics have probably heard about anterior pelvic tilt. That's where the pelvis, if you imagine it like a bucket of water, actually tips forward. And when it tips forward, we get a lengthening effect in the hamstrings and we have a shortening effect on the lower back. We have a shortening effect on the hip flexors and a lengthening effect on the abdominals. So it is a positional change and shift that causes our pelvis to go forward and our weight bearing to go forward. Now when in this situation, the hamstrings, as I said, are being put into a lengthened position very similar to the back muscles, or the upper back, I should say, when somebody slouches. Those muscles are not turning off. What's happening is they're being lengthened and they're having to work harder in a deleveraged position. So they will, of course, get used to that function, but the question is, is that ideal? Well, that's gonna depend on a lot of factors that I don't really wanna discuss here, but I do wanna say that anterior pelvic tilt, forward weight bearing and so forth is not a pathological problem. It just is, it's what the person is doing. Now, for our purposes, when we talk about the hamstrings in this situation, when somebody tends to have an anterior pelvic tilt, the hamstring origin insertion between the uh, sit bone and the uh, bottom of the knee here is being put in a lengthened position. So if we were to bend forward and try to test our ability to touch the toes, most often this should result in an inability to touch the toes. Why? Because the hamstrings are already being pre-stretched. So if they're being pre-stretched and you try to bend forward, you're not gonna be able to hit the toes, okay? So the reality is, is that if people have a lot of anterior pelvic tilt and they're able to touch their toes, they're thought to have excess flexibility, okay? Which may not be optimal. Now, the other reason why someone may not be able to touch their toes, if you start to bend forward and you can't make that contact in an anterior pelvic tilt is because the extension muscles, the spinal extensors, are not able to actually release and let go fully, thus allowing enough rounding of the back to occur. So there has to be enough movement of the pelvis going forward and a movement of the back being able to go down. So the hamstrings can be too stretched out and then the back muscles cannot loosen and that combination of factors is gonna cause you the inability to touch your toes. Number one, when you just try to touch your toes, it is not a 100% representation of your hamstring flexibility. It is testing the entire chain and we don't know what the ratio is there most often unless we tease it out. So in this video, I'm gonna show you as an isolated hamstring test, 
that we lay on the back and you can see what the length of the hamstrings are just by flexing and bending the knee or doing a straight leg raise test and that can give us an idea of where the tightness actually is. So I'll show that one in here now. Okay, so when we're measuring the hamstring length while laying on the back, there's a couple of features that usually have to be discussed. Number one, what are we measuring? The challenge here when we're doing a straight leg raise assessment with the hamstrings is that we're also getting an idea of what's going on with the sciatic nerve. Classic test here is if there is disc-based issues from the lumbar spine, then that can inhibit the straight leg raise too. Doesn't always have to produce neural type of sensations. It can also present as a stretch-based sensation on the back of the leg. So let's set that one aside, but realize that that is a consideration. So when we're looking to test the straight leg raise, this is oftentimes performed improperly because oftentimes the leg is being raised without any considerations to what the pelvis is doing. Just realize because the hamstring attaches to the bone underneath here called the sit bone, that if we start to pull this leg up, then it's going to move that sit bone and posteriorly rotate the pelvis. That's where the pelvis rocks back and the back is flattening against the ground or the table in this case. So proper testing is monitoring what's going on Oftentimes it's um, a good recommendation to stick the hand underneath the lower back and monitor the curve so that as the leg starts to go up, the moment we start to feel the pressure increase in the lower back area, that is the test, okay? So it's very common for people to think that they have far more ham flex hamstring flexibility than they do because they're not monitoring. And as the leg is going up, the spine is flattening and it looks better. So to some degree, we have to be mindful of this as getting a good uh, indication of what the hamstring length is actually doing. Another classic test is bringing the thigh up, monitoring the curve in the lower back, and then actively extending the leg to see how high the leg can go, and then getting a measurement here. That's another way to go as well, to get an idea of what is going on with hamstring length. So the straight leg raise test can be done actively or passively but the key is to make sure that the monitoring is going on at the lumbar spine and the pelvis in order to get an accurate test. So this is something we can use uh, versus the standing forward bending or the toe touch test to get an idea of what's going on specifically in the hamstrings versus that global stretching effect when you're just bending forward. Okay, welcome back. And as you just saw with that supine leg raising test, you can get an idea of what's going on with the hamstring length. So now we have to figure out what we wanna do about it. Now one key factor that I want to raise here is that hamstrings, while you can affect the pelvis and relax the lower back with a hamstring stretch, most people do not have very strong hamstrings, okay? If we have to think about what the hamstrings do, they do a lot of hip extension work, but they also do knee flexion. Some of the strongest hamstrings that we'll find in athletes is in sprinters, which is a lot of power-based movement of that foot hitting the ground and accelerating through into hip extension. Most people are sedentary and are not doing that kind of activity, not going to the gym doing barrels of uh, leg curls and so forth to, to hypertrophy or grow the hamstrings. So we can make a reasonable assumption that a lot of people generally have weakness in their hamstring muscles. So if you have a tendency to have weakness in the hamstring muscles, is it a good idea to continue stretching them, to try to lengthen them even more, to give them even less leverage? To me, that doesn't really make sense. So most people actually need to get stronger hamstrings, not push more and more flexibility. I have nothing wrong with flexible hamstrings as long as they are strong, that is my rule. So with the hamstrings, we actually want to make them stronger to encourage this posterior pelvic tilting, to relax the lower back or to get the tension out not continue lengthening them while ignoring the tension in the spinal extensor muscles, okay? So our goal is to change the ratio in that test so we can be able to touch the toes properly with sufficient hamstring strength and sufficiently being able to relax the spinal extensors. Now there's a couple of ways to go about this. Now number one, teaching posterior pelvic tilt techniques which are exercises, for example, learning how to stand and to rock your pelvis underneath you and, and to tense your hamstrings. And then two is doing forward reaching. So the combination here, remember, is if the pelvis is tilting forward and we have a lot of arch in the lower back, we have long hamstrings and short spinal extensors. We want to reverse that activity by shortening the hamstrings with the posterior pelvic tilt, 
that also, also lengthens the spinal extensors and also doing some reaching activities. Now you can see as I reach, you can see my spine and my rib cage starting to round on the back side. Now, if we perform that, we're going to get a stretch back there in those spinal extensors. The second piece that's really important is to take a nice big deep inhale into that section of the spine as we're rolling that pelvis under and then reaching with our arms. If I breathe in really deep, I'm gonna get expansion of the backside of the ribs, which we call the posterior mediastinum. As we stretch that out, and lengthen those spinal extensors, getting them to relax and facilitate our exhalation muscles in the front, then we're gonna help restore the ratio of tension between the hammies and the spinal extensors. So that can be very helpful. And oftentimes after doing that activity and then bending down and touching the toes, been able to get a lot of people to be able to touch their toes who haven't been able to do so for years without stretching the hamstrings. Now another thing that can restrict your ability to bend forward and touch your toes is the movement of your hips. So if the hip muscles in particular are stuck in a, what we could call an externally rotated position or more like a Donald Duck position, then the hips cannot internally rotate as well as they need to and move slightly backward. This can be due to restriction in the gluteal tissues and what we call the posterior capsule. So a lot of people will also need the ability to stretch into their hip capsules on both sides to allow that hip to be able to rotate inward and thus facilitate the restoration of balance in the pelvis that we just talked about. So stretching back into the hips on each side and then also restoring with posterior mediastinum expansion can allow us to bend forward and to actually make contact with the toes, okay? So those are a couple of key pieces that we're looking at here. Now, mind you that I have not talked about hamstring length itself. These techniques, once we restore these balances, provide more of a neuromuscular release. So as I mentioned in throughout most of my videos, that the nervous system determines the tension that we have in muscles for the most part. So a lot of these neuromodulatory techniques, i.e. turning things on, breathing, getting things to relax, can result in some fairly immediate changes in muscle length on testing. Now, of course, we have to do things repetitively and build up strength, build up endurance, and so forth to be able to hold on to that functionality, so that's really, really important. But there are scenarios in which muscles themselves can actually just be short and tight. And some people have that. Genetically, they're short in the hamstrings or whatever. And those might benefit from more uh, low intensity, longer duration stretches and so forth. But what's most important for us to do is to clear those neuromuscular causes of tension first because they're really easy to get things to happen and to change and we can get an idea of what's really possible, okay? There are some other neurological influences on an inability to touch the toes, which I don't want to go through in depth here, but it could be a uh, position in the jaw, for example. There could be occlusional changes there. Also, inability to properly respirate into certain areas of the rib cage, which will influence your extension muscle tension and so forth. Some of these things can be cleaned up with simple massage therapy and stretching techniques. Some might involve further evaluation, but those are less common, okay? So take home points here. Make sure we understand the difference between lengthening in the hamstrings and the need to stretch them versus strengthening them. The ratio of the hamstrings versus the spinal extensor musculature in particular in relationship to an anterior pelvic tilt. The flexibility of the posterior capsule in the hip with the ability to rotate forward and the hips go in as they're supposed to. And also some of the other related imbalances that can occur there which can trigger neuromuscular tension. So I hope this is a helpful video and a few techniques might cause you to look at things and evaluate things differently in your body so that you can focus on getting the optimum correction, should I say, for the outcomes in this case, being able to touch your toes. Thank you so much for watching. Sam Visnick here, Release Muscle Therapy. Do me a favor, give this video a like, comment below, and of course, be sure to subscribe to the channel.
so you can get access to new videos as they come available. Thanks for watching.